Good afternoon, everyone. I wish I could be there in person to present this work, but I'll give my contact information at the end, so please feel free to reach out. My presentation today is going to focus on the GROW program. So I'll go through some background on that very briefly, and then I'll get into the evidence on social norms that came through the studies, as well as lessons on what evidence we have on shifting norms. And finally, we'll touch on recommendations for future research and future programming on women's economic empowerment. So the Growth and Economic Opportunities for Women program, or GROW, is an initiative that set out to generate evidence to improve poor women's lives while promoting economic growth. The program is implemented by Canada's International Development Research Centre, the IDRC, and is a joint initiative of the IDRC, the UK Department for International Development, and the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation. GROW was launched in 2013 and funded research in about 50 countries around the world with primary research done in 18 countries um, and there were 14 studies as part of GROW. So GROW's initial objectives and the calls for proposals that went with that focused on strengthening evidence in three areas. The first is the barriers to women's economic participation, what keeps them out of the labor force or stuck in poor quality precarious work within it. Second is the relationship between overall national sort of economic growth and women's empowerment. And the third is whether increased gender equality or the policies and programs that aim to increase gender equality um, lead to economic growth. Very broadly, we found that, in, that certain interventions and policies do create, do increase female labor force participation, but the extent of that varies by context. And that national economic growth and social policies or progress don't always affect women's economic empowerment. For example, we know that there has been a great deal of progress on girls' education, but this has not resulted in better work opportunities for women. That kind of social progress has far outpaced economic progress. It's also important to say that from the outset, we didn't explicitly seek information on the role of norms or how they change, but the evidence generated clearly demonstrated that social norms are major barriers to realizing women's economic empowerment, and it's critical that we acknowledge that and that we learn to address these deeply ingrained norms if we intend to make progress. As I said before, in our calls and in our selection process, we didn't explicitly seek out projects that address social norms or experiment with norm change or behavior change, but what we found was evidence on the barriers that women face in accessing decent work, and these barriers can often only be explained by social norms. This is what we mean by implicit. Gender norms are implicit, both in the work that we've supported and in the lives of women. So we found that norms are evident in the research on female labor force participation patterns, women's access to jobs, and occupational choices. We know that the responsibility for caring for children and other family members largely rests on the shoulder of women, and this has major implications for opportunities outside of the home. But I actually won't focus much on the lessons from our care work um, for this presentation, because I think the other speakers on this panel are going to offer a lot more insight into that in their presentations. Here, the evidence tells us that there has been uneven change in female labor force participation rates globally. For example, it's very high in Sub-Saharan Africa, but that hides really important information about the quality of jobs, the hours worked, and so on. And on the other hand, evidence in South Asia tells us that there is a slow rise, or in some cases, stagnation or decline in female labor force participation. In India, women are actually leaving the labor force at pretty high rates. And these rates don't necessarily align with overall sort of national economic growth rates, which tell us that there is some other factor that are, that's keeping women from engaging in work. Um, and the research suggests that those factors are social. For example, women's care responsibilities, infrastructure limitations like water being you know, far from the home, um, violence against women, both in and out of the workplace. This largely affects women's participation in the workforce and can lead to loss of wages and opportunities. And although mobility and access to transportation can increase women's participation rates, these structures cannot be gender blind. A study in Pakistan found that women are likely to take longer routes to work in order to avoid areas they consider unsafe, and that the majority of women surveyed have experienced some form of harassment on transit routes. And the next point on occupational and sectoral segregation I think is very important. This links clearly to the concept of women's work, work that is undervalued, underpaid, typically informal, precarious, and often characterized as drudgery. Researchers have found that occupational and sectoral segregation are not really changing, and in some cases are increasing for women in spite of growth or in spite of trade liberalization or other external factors. Uh, this work clearly demonstrates that social norms are embedded in gendered patterns of work. 
while we see that women are still largely concentrated in sectors that are typically low growth, they offer sort of low quality work, there are cases where women have entered male dominated higher growth sectors. But even within that, we see really strong occupational segregation. Women are still primarily getting the jobs in the margin of the industry, poor quality, low pay, a lot of the same issues. So in other words, an increase in female labor force participation has actually led to increased occupational segregation. It's incredibly sticky and really hasn't been changing over time. Another study I wanna mention on this point is uh, out of Carleton University, where they explored the challenges and opportunities for female artisanal and small scale miners in Central and East Africa. Women in mining often have lower level jobs, lower wages, like cleaning, cooking for workers, you know, female dominated tasks. And it's very difficult to break into the mining positions that are likely to pay a higher wage. And while a few, while a few women did actually manage to enter those roles, this was largely because of men that they called gatekeepers, men who would vouch for them, men who would give them support um, and support them within the other, like amongst the other miners as well, to take on that role. And as I said, this was uncommon, but it is a sign of positive change. And it shows that the involvement of men is really essential to women's economic advancement. So in terms of evidence of social norm change, I will say that it is limited in this body of work. And this is likely because we didn't go out looking to test interventions on this, but there, there is still some evidence that it's worth discussing. Uh, the first finding is that women's agency and empowerment starting from that can shift social norms, at least within the household and also in the community. Uh, in, a center, in a study by the Center for Budget and Policy Studies in, two, in um, two rural states in India, researchers looked at the impact of the Mahila Samakya Women's Empowerment Program. Essentially, the program creates women's groups as an avenue for collectivization to allow women a space to sort of engage actively with others outside of their home. Um, social norms, particularly around gender, are really aggressively challenged within these groups and explicitly discussed, and women are able to question their own roles and sort of relate to other women. Um, and the heightened agency that comes often from participating in these groups lead women to take on leadership roles within the group, work outside of the group or outside of the home, and and to gain more decision-making power within their household. Their visibility in the community also gives them a higher social status. Uh, in some countries, researchers found that labor participation, income, and control over resources from a higher income gave women more decision-making ability, which shows that policies and programs that help women break into new sectors and roles and increase their income can have a positive effect on household relationships and wider norms. And importantly, and I mentioned this earlier, men do need to be included in any program that aims to change gender norms. In the mining study that I talked about, women who did earn more income and gain decision-making power did so because certain male gatekeepers brought them into those mining roles. And the same can be said about all of the transportation issues. There are only so many policies that can be sort of enacted without directly addressing the perceived acceptability of harassment in public spaces. So I'll go quickly, I think I'm coming to the end. Um, as I've said, GROW focuses on research driven to enhance women's economic empowerment. What we found is that social norms come through often unintentionally. Social norms need to be explicitly identified and measured to understand what factors contribute to women's economic advancement and their empowerment. There needs to be a focus on measuring social norms within women's economic empowerment programs. We often see you know, issue, like indicators like female labor force participation as a sort of sign of women's empowerment, but we're increasingly finding that women are not engaging in productive and secure work. It's not necessarily empowering and they aren't necessarily making a choice. The focus needs to shift to understanding how underlying social norms contribute to women's sort of active engagement in the labor markets. Women are increasingly becoming more educated, but they're not participating on the same level as men in economic and political spaces. In some instances, girls are outpacing boys in school enrollment and completion, but their economic participation still lags behind so understanding these trends is becoming increasingly relevant in order to expand sort of women's work opportunities and their abilities. The next point on behavior change versus, versus social norm change is one that I find very important. Uh, this is a discussion that I imagine happens a great deal in environments like this conference, and we do want more insight into the implications. Grow supported a couple of programs that led to behavior change through the use of incentives, but is that sustainable? What's unclear is whether incentives contributed to a behavioral change rather than a social norm change. I recommend that economists and practitioners looking at women's economic empowerment need to increasingly work with practitioners in social and behavior change to produce evidence on how to create an environment in which women can choose whether and how to work, to what to exercise agency, agency and to have control over resources. 
So I'll stop there. If there are any questions, please feel free to contact me. My information is listed here, and I'm sure the rest of the presentations will be very insightful, and I hope you have a meaningful discussion. Thank you.